God has brought us to this place. Guests, let me welcome you. If you are a guest with us today, I'm Mike Gillen, pastor here at Cornerstone, and I'm grateful that we can be joined together for this worship time. I really do believe that even though we may not know it, the Spirit of God has brought us here today to hear, to worship, to experience the, the God that is inviting us to something greater than we imagined, to find a place in God's good purposes. Yesterday I was at a meeting with a lot of other Methodists, uh, 15 of our own folks went to this annual meeting we have called the Charge Conference, and at that meeting the speaker, who was a, a pastor actually working in our denominational offices in Columbia, he said, whether you know it or not, God has meant for you to be in this meeting. That's what he said yesterday. And I heard him say, God meant for you, God has something for you in this meeting, and this is what I thought. Because I'm a pastor and I'm a little bit skeptical about the pastors. I said, yeah, right. The reason I'm here is because I was forced to be here. My, I have to be here today. And you know, I was wrong. I was so wrong. There was something there I needed to hear, and it really made a difference for me and what I will be doing as your leader and pastor in the coming weeks and months and I'm convinced today there is something here for you that you don't even expect that will be beneficial to you, that will help you to discover God's good grace for you today. So I'm looking forward, maybe you've already experienced it in fact. And so you're just gonna kind of float along in God's grace today, great. Maybe the Spirit of God has still got something for you and me, I can't wait to find out what it is. In fact, it could have something to do with the fact that we are in the middle of our generosity initiative called Dive In. Uh, dive in is a way for us to discover God's grace as we embrace a three-year effort to begin to plan for and then to implement a building program that will lead us towards greater ministry for this community. It's a three-year initiative. The first goal of Dive In is 100% engagement. What we're hoping for is that everyone, uh, everyone from children to people in their 90s and older can all participate in this ongoing initiative that will last for three years that is meant to help us find a way to easily afford the building program that we're, we're going to have. So the first goal is 100% is engagement. We want people to be involved in, in worship, in prayer, in Bible study. By the way, I've got a Bible study on Mondays during this dive-in campaign, Monday nights and Monday afternoons, so 1.30 to 2.30 and 6 to 7. Our first dive-in Bible study was last week. It was great. I hope you'll be here tomorrow. Uh, there's room for you, and you don't have to have been at last week's Bible study to be at this week's Bible study. But what I've discovered is that as we're praying together, as we're worshiping together, as we're studying together, that God is then challenging all of us to dive into God's good work. And our second goal in Dive In is a $750,000 goal that within three years we'll collect $750,000 that helps then for us to have a very manageable mortgage payment every month, being able to afford that payment as we build uh, significant additions to the church. And the, the building program has three main focuses to it. There's foci, if you will. The first focus is that we're building on a legacy of faith. As the oldest church in O'Fallon, Cornerstone, with 210 years of ministry life, is just beginning. And this is a chance for us, not only to build on that legacy of faith, but also to, well, it's time for us to build a legacy of our own, to put our, our footprint on the legacy of Cornerstone. And as we do that, what we'll be doing is we'll be building for the next generations, for children and youth, and we'll have significant building space that will enhance the ministries we have to children and youth. But then we'll also do what we've always been doing, and we'll reach out to the community. In fact, Cornerstone, as the first church in O'Fallon, was literally part of the beginnings of this community. So we have been able to provide a spiritual DNA for O'Fallon. It's important for us to build on that spiritual influence and to be an important part of O'Fallon for years to come. And Dive In will help us in that building program to make this something that really is, uh, let's say, impactful, not just for us, but for our community and our world. I think today you're gonna to discover that Cornerstone already is making an impact on lives, not just your life, but on lives that you may not have even known about. And what's important is for us to realize that as we dive in, there is a way for us to find our place in what God has for us. There's a way for us to find a place in the work God is doing. There's a way for us to find our place in dive in. There's a way for us to find our place in this life that we're living every day. So I hope that you've got some material that you'll need in order to dive in. We have these booklets that we've handed out to people last week, and we have more of them to give to you. If you don't have this booklet with you after the service, I hope you'll stop in at the dive in table where you'll find that we have these booklets and we have other things, materials to help you understand what dive in is. What you'll find in this booklet, among other things, is you'll find the, the weekly message notes. 
You'll also find a prayer guide. In fact, each week we have a different week of prayer, a different focus for scripture and ideas to lead you every day through prayer. So I hope you'll grab one of these booklets and find out how you can be involved in the activities of Dive In. It also has, in addition to that prayer guide and the message notes, this book it also tells you about a lot of the different questions that people are asking me and others about Dive In. So it asks important questions and answers those. And then there's a lot of other details about what we're doing exactly in Dive In and how you can be a part of the ministry of, of this church as we move forward and dive in. So please, as you leave today, if you don't have your booklet with you today, I hope that you'll grab a booklet and that you'll take it home with you. It'll be part of your, your walk for the next few weeks as we are diving in together. The scripture for this morning, it strikes me as a scripture that speaks to who we are, whether we know it or not. It talks about a man who's, like so many of us, looking for God's work, God's healing, God's help. And every day of his life, for years and years, he's been going to a place where it's been rumored that angels come and stir up the waters of that pool by Bethesda. And if people get in as those, pool, those waters are moving, they can be healed. He's been sitting there. Can you imagine someone carrying you to this place and leaving you there? And then he's all by himself all day, hoping to get in. And he's challenged because he can't really find his place. I wonder if you've been like that too, or you've been wondering, where's your place in God's good work? What's God doing with you? I know I've been there many times, wondering, is God really, really that interested in me? I can remember before I was pastor here, I was pastoring three churches in Pike County, wonderful people, historic churches, but challenged. We had economic challenges at the time because of the Great Recession. We also had demographic challenges because if you don't know this, in the northeast section of Missouri, people are leaving to go to the cities because there's not a lot of work. Family farms are being squeezed by corporate farms, and people are just getting older. And the Methodist churches in the northeast part of our state, it's actually, if I go, it's that way. They're getting smaller, those churches are. I had one church. Beautiful church in Eolia. I wish you could go with me to that church just to experience the beautiful stained glass windows as the light shines in on Sunday mornings. My first few months there, it's actually in the, the, the late winter, early spring of that first year there. A very small congregation. I thought there were like 15 or 20 people. I found out the first Sunday there were four in that congregation. We get to February and we get a couple of warm weeks. And we've got six people in the room, so we're doing great, right? The power of preaching, right? And it gets warm, and we have a family of wasps, not, not white Anglo-Saxon Protestants, but actual wasps floating through the sanctuary, and there were more bugs than there were people. And I'm preaching there. It's one of three places I preach every Sunday then, and I'm preaching there at nine o'clock, and I'm dodging wasps, and I'm not telling people, but I'm scared of these things. And I'm thinking to myself, the whole, by the way, by the time we were done, it took three weeks to get rid of the wasps. By the third week, I said to the church folks, I said, I, we gotta get rid of them. We just gotta, they gotta go. But while I'm dodging them, I'm thinking to myself the whole time, is this what God has for me? I've been working hard. Been I didn't even live in that community. I live in St. Charles. I'm driving up there every day. This, this what God has for me? Have I committed career suicide by saying yes to God and coming to Missouri? We, were, we transferred. I was transferring in from another denomination in another state. Have you been there? Is this all God has for me? The guy by the pool in that first century world in Jerusalem that Jesus happens upon is lying by that pool. He can't walk. He's been like that for 38 years, and he says, is this all God has for me? I'm telling you today, there's more. First idea this morning is this. We should be looking for God to heal us. Now, oftentimes, we get confused with this whole healing stuff that Jesus does. And we say, when we or someone we love does not get healed, and we're devastated, we say, where's God? The point to this healing is not that this guy got up and walked away. It's that he met the Savior. That guy ended up dying. There is some place in the Middle East, somewhere in Jerusalem, where we can find the remnants of that man because he did not live forever. 
But he needed something more than to be physically healed. He needed to encounter the Savior. Every time that Jesus heals in the scriptures, it's not about the fact that sometimes we get better when we don't expect to. It's about that when we encounter Jesus, we are changed forever, spiritually, eternally. We should be looking for God to heal us. We shouldn't be surprised that God heals us. We should want healing and expect it. But we should understand this is healing of a spiritual kind. I was lucky enough to go to Jerusalem after college, uh, among other things I did in that, that month after college, and I actually got to go to this place. This is the Pool of Bethesda. It's what it looks like now. It's actually part of a very large kind of complex, a lot of it that has been unearthed during archaeological excavation. This, point has, this part looks like this. I have some photograph in a box buried somewhere in our basement that we moved from Richmond, Virginia eight years ago, almost nine years ago now. So I don't know where this picture is. We found this on the internet. But I stood right there. I took that picture, almost exactly the same picture. Probably looks just as good a quality if actually in my box in the basement. Can you imagine being one of those people? In the ancient world, there was this saying, nothing ventured, nothing gained. They heard, you could get healed here. So they thought, well, what else have we got? Let's try it. When that man's sitting at that, that poolside, he's day after day experienced nothing. And then Jesus shows up and says to him, hey, do you want to get better? Isn't that a crazy question? Do you want to get better? Do you want to get healed? Today, I'm telling you, the Spirit of God is in this room with us, and each of us needs healing. None of us are healthy and whole. One of the great mistakes that folks who go to church all the time begin to believe, one, one of the great lies that Christians begin to tell themselves, is that somehow they've gotten better than other people when they've gone to church enough. It is the wrong message. If you think you're better than someone who is outside the church right now, spiritually speaking, you have missed the point of what Christ is doing for us. The church is not a place where better people go to cling together and convince each other they're better than everyone else. The church is a spiritual hospital for the spiritually sick. And this morning, we are all at that, that poolside, desperately needing Jesus to walk up to us and ask us the question, do you want to be made well? Isn't that a stupid question, right? No. Most of us do not really want to be made spiritually well by Jesus. Because if we really say yes to him, he's going to make us walk after him. And I don't know if you know this or not, but that cross up there, one above me here, is made by a man named Raleigh Jessup, part of our legacy leavers, a man who left a legacy of faith at this church after many, many years of service. We have this cross that we moved from the other church building when we moved here in 2001 to remind us that it's not just about us, but that we are part of centuries of service to God through faith in Christ and the leadership of the Holy Spirit. And so often we come to church and we forget that if we say yes to Jesus, he's going to do something to us. And then we've got to do something. But the promise is we'll be healed little by little. We should be looking for God to heal us. Second idea this morning. It's tough to find our place in God's healing pool. You may think you walked in here on your own, of your own accord, on your own power, you know, under complete control. I'm telling you, the Spirit of God influenced you to get in here. You may not have known it. You may not want to believe it. But you, like me, are having trouble figuring out where is my place in that healing, spiritual, grace-filled pool. Because the pool can look like this to us when we're trying to do everything ourselves. Doesn't that look crazy? So this is a, this is a pool in, in China, and uh, a lot of pools look like this in China. When I was pastor in Richmond, Virginia, I had a couple of guys who were from India who moved into the area, started coming to our church. They didn't know each other, by the way. 
They were just a couple of guys who had master's degrees in information technology, and they found jobs in America. And they actually met each other at the church. They were sitting a couple rows back from each other, and as I met them, I said to each one of them, you know each other? And one guy had already left. It turns out they were from the same small town in India. It's called Hyderabad. It's in the south part of India. There's only a couple million people in that little town. All right, let me try that again. In India, a little town is only a couple million people. I was talking to one of the guys, and he said to me, you know, the biggest difference for me is, one, in America, the grocery stores have lots of food. He said he would take pictures, email them to his family. They couldn't believe what it really looks like to live in America. The second thing he says, he said to me is, he said, I'm really lonely here. I'm really lonely because where I grew up, where I lived all my life, it's shoulder-to-shoulder people. And here in America, I can wake up in the morning, I can go to work, I can come home, and I'm literally on my own almost the whole time. When we're thinking about jumping into God's healing pool, the purposes God has for us, sometimes we can't see our place. The reason is because we're looking by ourselves. The Spirit of God is not working in us. We're not saying, God, whatever you want to do to me, heal me, I'll do it. We aren't willing, we need that push from God to figure out where our place is. Now let me tell you the truth. The healing pool of God's grace that we're supposed to dive into, it actually looks like this. That's what it really looks like. When our eyes are opened, when we see at seven years old there's purpose for us, when we see at 35 years old there's purpose for us, when we're 94, there's purpose for us. It's different. Like you're not gonna swim laps if you can't swim well. If you're 94 and you're physically infirmed, you may just need to soak a bit. But you're still, there's still a place for you in God's work. How do we find our place? How do we find our place in God's healing pool? Well, I have to tell you, one of the reasons we have trouble finding our place in God's healing pool is because we have some misunderstandings about what all this is about. Their idea is we can misunderstand what healing looks like and where to find it. See, sometimes, you know, I, I mentioned in the first service, I think there are a lot of country songs where this, this theme gets worked out. You know, the looking for love in all the wrong places kind of songs? Because we are looking for healing spiritually in all the wrong places. Work. We look for it there. Give me purpose, God, and I can work all I want. Then we miss the fact that we have forgotten about our families. Or we invest all our time in our family, we realize, wait a minute, I'm still not satisfied. And we miss opportunities. Or we come to church, and church would seem like that place where you can discover God for real. And we get caught up in the humanness of church, in how church should be about me. Give me what I want. And we forget, we aren't created to create stuff for us at our core At our spiritual core, we are created to serve God, to bring glory to God, to follow Christ, to allow the Spirit of God to lead us. People get confused about church. They think somehow it's different, where people here get to be more perfect more quickly than everybody else. I can tell you right now, that's not how it works. This is a spiritual hospital, and we're all sick. But we can find healing in and through this ministry Why have we been here for 210 years? Not because we've got nowhere else to go or nothing else to do on Sunday. We are discovering something, and people have been for generations. And this morning, I wanna show you how as we have been diving into God's grace, God's been healing someone just like you that's in our midst today. And his testimony, let me tell you, it's changing my life, it's gonna change yours. Watch this with me. Cornerstone is a lifesaver to me, it really is. It's a place that I can turn to. Back when this last recession was real bad, I lost my job. I struggled to try to make my house payments for about a year and a half, and I needed help. And I was introduced to Cornerstone through the food pantry program. I came every week, I got food from Cornerstone. I don't know how else I would have survived some weeks. And eventually I lost my home. I 
and, and had to start over completely. But through the love that I felt when I walked in these doors on Wednesday mornings and those ladies greeted me, it, it, it just stuck with me. And uh, that's how I came to know Cornerstone. I ventured around a little bit locally here since we had to move. I went to a few churches and then I had a friend that was attending here and he said, come on up to Cornerstone. I said, I know Cornerstone. And sure enough, I walked in the door. I was greeted by some great people as I walked in the door. And I said, you know what? I don't know why I haven't been here sooner because as soon as I walked in the door, it was, hey, this is where I belong. And I've been here since. I've been here now just, just around two years. I can come here and I can volunteer do things I can usher like I have been for the last year. And I love greeting people. You know, once you get to know the people, it's like, oh, how are you doing? And they respond the same to me. I've met so many great people here. I look forward to Sunday mornings, but I just enjoy helping. I feel that the more I give to this church, the more our community is going to see that we are here. Dive in to me is we can do this. We got a strong base. Let's let's do it. You know, dive in. We as Christians should dive in. You know, you see different organizations, different groups, they're diving in. You see it on the television. They're putting full effort into diving in. I think the Christian community needs to dive in. Our community. I don't think we do that enough. We're right there. Let's get it. Let's go get it. The more people you get in, the more ideas you have. We need to listen and have an open mind. Let's, let's do it. We need to dive in. Everyone should dive in, <laughs> you know. Man, I love that. I mean, I don't know what you think. I think it's fantastic. That's Chris McLean. Chris McLean's right back there, right in front of me, right behind all of you. You may have seen him greet you. If you haven't, I want after the service for you to walk up to Chris. He will love this. And you hug him and squeeze him, and you tell him thank you for inspiring you to lead a life that really exemplifies God's grace. We can misunderstand what healing looks like and where to find it, but Chris just showed us. And I bet you could say the same story in some way or other, how Cornerstone is helping you to discover your place in God's healing pool, in that grace that you need, that life you need. Jesus is leading us, fourth idea, Jesus is leading us, each of us, to find a place in his eternal work. I have colleagues who have retired from ministry who used to hire out and invite other pastors to come in and talk about money because pastors used to be scared to talk about money. Now, I, I grew up during the televangelist era when you couldn't trust a televangelist on TV because they always asked for money and all they did was line their own pockets. So I grew up in that era where I'm not supposed to, as your pastor, spend a lot of time talking about money, but I have to tell you, I've discovered the only way for us to, to be the church here in O'Fallon as Cornerstone is for us to support it financially in addition to all the other ways we work for this church and in this church. Jesus is leading each of us to find a place in the work we're doing because this work we're doing is eternal. So I have a suggestion for you. I want you to look at this chart with me. Now, the commitment cards we've given to you all or we will give to you if you haven't gotten one yet. You can get one, by the way, at the Dive Encounter or as, you, as you leave today. It's a different chart than this one. This chart shows how if different people give different amounts so on the left-hand side, the number of folks or families who are giving a certain amount on the right-hand side, if we total all of that up, we actually get above $750,000. So let me talk to some of you first. There are some of you here today who are financially blessed in a way that allows you, at this point in your life, to give a significant legacy gift. And so we've included at the top of this chart, there's some folks here who can give $75,000 or $50,000 or $25,000. In fact, we've already had one family give $50,000. Now, don't misunderstand me. Just because it says three 
does not mean only three people are allowed to give $50,000 today. But maybe you're that person who you have been investing in the stock market for years. And unlike your pastor, Mike Gillen, you invested in Amazon when it was at $3 a share. Because you thought, why not? I'd like to get stuff at home. And I like books. That's all it was back then. So you've got significant stock holdings in Amazon or something else. If you're to cash out that stock now, you're going to pay significant capital gains tax. But if you donate it to the church, you don't pay a cent in tax. We get to sell it and keep all of the proceeds ourselves for ministry, and you actually get a tax write-off that's really significant, actually, at the end of the year. Last year, someone gave us a stock gift, gave the church a stock gift. We had to open up a brokerage account to be able to sell that stock gift. And so we're able to handle something like if you have a stored resource like stock. Um, Someone asked me, why aren't you keeping that stock and just living off the dividends? And the answer is twofold. One, we are not an investment house, not a hedge fund, not a brokerage firm. So the church doesn't expect us to keep investments unless we're forced to by some kind of trust or, or willful gift, will gift. But, but two, stock goes up and down. And so if we were to lose 50% of the stock because of something happening, then that would be bad stewardship on our part. So that's why we don't keep stocks unless we're forced to. So in any case... Maybe you're one of those folks who can give a one-time gift or a three-year gift, and it's at the top of that chart. Now, some of you are like me, and you're like, dream on, Pastor. I want you to look at the very bottom here of the list. Maybe you've really never given to the church before, and this is a great time for you to begin trusting God financially by giving something to support the ministry of this church. And really, the best way for you to dive in is to start with something small like $5 a week. Now, that's the price of a Happy Meal at McDonald's, all right? If you just give that amount, what you'll find is you give $900 over the course of a year. And if we have a lot of folks doing that, we're we're getting there. My point is not to make you feel guilty or to feel pressured, but to show you there's a place for you. There's a place for you to dive into. To our guests this morning, I hope you don't feel like we're expecting you to give us anything. We're just grateful you're here with us, but it's time for us to think about our financial future and our ministry future together. And there is a place for everyone to dive in. And over the next three years, if we raise that money and get those pledges of $750,000, the mortgage we'll have is it's exactly the same monthly payment that we have now. I hope you're praying about how you can dive in and be a part of this legacy of faith that reaches out to the next generations and ministers to our community. There are so many people like Chris McLean living in O'Fallon in St. Charles County. They aren't going to church anywhere and they're waiting for you both to invite them to church and for Cornerstone to have something for them that will change their life. They're just waiting for it. In fact, they may have come to the food pantry and you don't know it. Or they may have been to our fall food truck fun festival or to an Easter egg hunt or maybe to one of our holiday services and you don't know it. And when you say, hey, come to church with me, they're like, I already know Cornerstone. Yeah, I'll come to church with you. And if you're supporting Dive In, I can't wait for them to be able to see and to experience the ministry that will continue to grow here. So Jesus is leading us, each of us, to find our place in this eternal work here at Cornerstone. Fifth idea is this. The healing and purpose come together in Christ's saving grace. When we say yes to God and we discover that this is a church that is a spiritual hospital healing the spiritually ill, which we all are, when we discover that, we realize that healing is always connected to living purpose-filled lives in Jesus' name, that we live better by faith. As we participate in the support of this ministry, as we see what will be built, which is the next slide today, we get to see the, the ministry future taking shape. We see our legacy happening rather than leaving something that we hope someone will build in the future. We discover who we're meant to be. The scriptures challenge us at every turn to look for and receive Jesus 
and to serve God with all of who we are. In the Bible study this past week, one of the scriptures was a scripture from the book of Malachi. And I had someone in the study say to me, and he, he was here in first service, he said to me uh, last Monday, I've heard way too many sermons on giving money and stewardship and finances. And he's been in many capital campaigns like Dive In. And he said, I've never heard this scripture preached before. So I said, well, guess what? You're gonna be in luck, because here it is. So the prophet Malachi, that's the last book of the Old Testament in our Bible, speaks for God, and here's what God says to us. Begin by being honest. He's speaking to you and me right now, so we can respond. Do honest people rob God? The answer, of course, is what? No, honest people don't rob God. Here's the dagger in the side. But you rob me day after day, God says. You asked, of course, how have we robbed you? And God replies, the tithe and the offering, that's how. And now you're under a curse, the whole lot of you, because you're robbing me. Now here's what I wanted you to really hear. This scripture is the challenge for us today. Bring your full tithe to the temple treasury so there will be ample provisions in my temple. Test me, God says. Test me in this and see if I don't open up heaven itself to you and pour out blessings beyond your wildest dreams. You may be saying to yourself today, I am not willing to dive in. Because I don't know if I have the money. I met with someone recently who told me they, weren't going, they didn't support the building program initiative because they didn't think they could give any more. But when there was such overwhelming support for the program, they chose to dive in too. And the person said to me, and I found $25 a week I can add to my giving, or a month that I can add to my giving. If you're already giving to the church and you don't know if you can give a penny more, hear me say this. Thank you for your generosity. If all you think you can give is $5 a week and you've never given anything before, let me challenge you. Dive in. Put God to the test. Claim this scripture. Test me in this, God says, and see if I don't bless you. What's the point of giving? It's not for the church to get more money. It's for us together to realize there are others who are spiritually ill, just like we are. And they're trying to find eternal healing, and they're not finding it. But they will here. It's time to dive in. Chris was right. Christians don't dive in enough. But we get the chance. Will you pray with me? God, help us to say yes to you, to dive in to your grace. Give us courage. Give us vision. Give us hope. In Christ's name, amen.